27 businesses in two years, which is just incredible. Now you already answered my question. So nine worked incredibly well. Nine were okay. You know, kind of hum, hummed and hawed what they were supposed to do. And then nine totally failed. And I think one of the things that you'd mentioned is that you should have been fired for some of them, should have been promoted for some of the others. And so I think sometimes when things go well, we give ourselves too much credit. When things go badly, we were like, oh, uh, not, you know, quick to maybe not accept some of that credit. Um, what did you learn from some of those that didn't necessarily work out so well? You know, uh, one of the things that we learned now, um, this will be different for than what some of your listeners are going through, right? They want to acquire a business and operate it. So we were trying to acquire companies that basically we could acquire them and they would continue to operate. And so we, we weren't going to place new people into those businesses. So we were really relying on the team that existed to manage those businesses going forward. And one of the big lessons that we learned was uh, if the key person in the business were the entrepreneur that we were writing the check to, right? If they were responsible or led sales, or if they were responsible or led operations, or were somehow otherwise critical to the business, um, those were, deals were much, much tougher post-closing than, trans, than companies where they had a really strong number two, right? A COO or a president. And, and I think the, the, the reasoning is as entrepreneurs, and, and I'm one today, you know, we're not really great at being good employees. Um, all that said, though, if you have somebody who's used to being an employee and who has run a successful company reporting to somebody else, they were great to work with. They were, the transition for them was a lot easier. But, you know, the moment that you write that check to that entrepreneur, their life changes and, you know, the motivations are different. So I would, you know, the big lesson that I took is, you know, the, if, if you're going to acquire a business and you're relying on that team to execute, you know, having a strong number two, because that entrepreneur's motivations are going to change, they're likely to leave. Um, and so, you know, making sure that you had a good transition plan and somebody that was a good number two place was really important. I think the other piece that, and I think this will be relevant to your listeners, is being crystal clear about what you're buying. When you buy a business, you know, you're, you're, you're buying the assets to that business. You're buying the ongoing operations. You might be acquiring elements of the balance sheet. But one of the things that um, I think most people forget about is you want to have acute clarity around what is the key piece of that business that, that is um, going to be critical for the success of that business going forward. And I'll give you an example. In, our, in, in the Exponets days, it really was the people right? We needed to have, because the customer relationships were there, the delivery, the installation teams, it was all people. And so being crystal clear about, all right, so if people in this business, if people are the main asset, what do I need to do to make sure that I protect that asset? Um, you know, that's communication planning, making sure that the benefits programs that we were putting in place were as good or better, making sure that we didn't upset the apple cart in terms of their roles and responsibilities. Um, conversely, one of my old bosses was one of the early guys at Nextel, um, as an old cellular carrier and they bought to get, to build their business. They bought taxi cab companies, which sounds strange, but taxi cab companies owned the frequency in those specific municipalities, right. Or those, those geographic areas. And so for them, the critical asset that has nothing to do with people, it was the frequency, right. The spectrum that those taxi cab companies owned. And so, it's, I think when you buy a company, you really want to nail down what is it that you're buying and imagine the 15 different ways that that asset could degrade in value or disappear, and then develop your game plan around trying to protect that and, and, and deal with those eventualities. Cause it's, it's going to happen. Acquisitions are challenging. I love how you said there's, there's 15 ways that this can disappear. Um, you know, you might think of, uh, five of them, you might think of eight of them, but there's probably 15 and maybe some of them are black swan events, but you know, we just went through 2020 <laughs> right. black swan events do happen. Um, so when, when you're integrating all these, it's really easy to say, Hey, there's some synergy across all these businesses. Um, it, it's a fun word to say, but it's incredibly difficult to implement. Oh. So how did you go about implementing, you know, you got 27 new divisions ranging from 5 million to, uh, did you just say 800 million in revenue? Yeah. How do you go about kind of syncing these, these across the board in such a short amount of time? So 
fortunately, when you, uh, all these businesses were in the same industry, right? So we were, the, the core business processes were relatively similar. I mean, the sales processes were, were fairly similar. The execution and implementation processes were relatively similar. And so we did a lot of work just trying to map those processes, right? Understand, hey, what's common? What are the things that we want to plan for in a new system and, and, and how we're going to do business? And so we spent a fair amount of time mapping those processes, making sure that we had something that was consistent. And then, you know, and I, I, I'm simplifying here, but then you, you, you know, you're looking at Siebel and Oracle. Those were the two platforms that we executed on. And it was, I will say it was a nosebleed, right? Um, you know, one of the things that we learned was, you know, you're much better off with those really sophisticated software solutions to take your processes and modify them to meet what's pretty much out of the box in those big applications um, versus, and this is where I think we made some mistakes, trying to customize that software to map to your current processes. Um, Cause it's uh, that became very apparent fairly early that we had made several mistakes again in trying to customize this piece of software, which was already world-class software. Hey, we were trying to customize it um, and that it just creates problems. But I think the, Again, integrating those businesses, um, the you know the probably the next big challenge just culturally when you acquire a business the size of Lucent's, you know it was their SMB group, small and medium sized business group. That that culture is a radically different culture than a five, ten, twenty million dollar revenue entrepreneurial run company, right? Those are radically different cultures, and so trying to integrate those, I think we. You know, we probably, I think some of it worked out pretty well and other parts of it were pretty challenging. 